Hi guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Daniel Rosal bringing you this video today from Jerusalem, uh, where it feels as if the magic uh, switch that flips between the seasons in Israel was just depressed. And uh, we've now entered the hot season where you need lots and lots of air conditioning. It's always interesting to me, having grown up in uh, Ireland, where uh, the weather is very variable, even within seasons, uh, but in Israel, the extent to which there don't seem to be far less of these intermediate seasons, spring and autumn, what the Americans uh, would call fall, seem to be much, much shorter here. So you're kind of, there's always a week or two you can pinpoint that, oh yeah, I remember there was one day like on a Sunday, you know, I was in my raincoat, uh, had my umbrella out, and then on Wednesday I was in shorts and uh, flip-flops. And likewise, in autumn, it kind of tends to happen in uh, in the reverse phenomenon. It just kind of very stark uh, transitions between the seasons here in Israel. But uh, it's getting sunny now, which is which is nice. So I want to talk today about. Um, I'd say this is in the concept of a video video blog is how I would describe this, or maybe a hot take might be a less kind way to put this. Um, I have mentioned recently. I'm trying to keep the YouTube channel this YouTube channel centered around the core themes of uh, Jerusalem, Israel, and the things I find interesting about living in this part of the world. I'm just going to emphasize, mention that one more time, that all the other videos that I've been doing up to now about topics like backup internet and M-Discs, and uh, I don't even know, there's probably Turkish coffee, um, although maybe that's a little bit uh, of, a, of an edge case because it kind of fits into the culture here. But uh, all that kind of tech stuff that people followed me for, Hate to disappoint, that's not going to be on this YouTube channel anymore. Um, I did start a little side YouTube channel called Daniel's Tech World, but uh, that's in the process of organization. But if you do want to stick around for videos on this YouTube channel, that's what you're going to be getting is stuff about uh, Israel and the Middle East and Jerusalem for the foreseeable future, including these hot takes. So that's the mix. Um, what I want to talk about today, uh, the hot take, it's going to probably bug some people, um, it won't be to everyone's palate. And that is something that I think is actually, if you are a creator, a writer, or a podcaster, or a YouTuber, or whatever, I actually think the Israel-Palestine conflict, the Israel-Palestinian conflict, is kind of a great uh, place to break your teeth, because it's impossible to say almost anything, or certainly to express an opinion about this conflict, without pissing someone off. Uh, whether it's the Israeli side or the Palestinian side, it's extremely difficult. I would say probably impossible to be in the neutral middle. Even news wires and you know people like Reuters, etc., will be accused often on the same day by both Israel and Palestinian supporters of bias for and against their sides. I'm just going to say that at the start, this is my opinion. Now I'm aware that being a Jewish immigrant to Israel, what we call in Hebrew olim, I'm part of the Jewish majority. So from the outside perspective, people would probably assume I'm 100% unequivocally pro-Israel. But within this block, about 75% of Israel's population, there are naturally divergent political views. And something that's been interesting for me particularly has been to see the role uh, to which language actually plays a role in this conflict here. And I'm going to give a few specific examples to try to tease out what I mean by this point, hopefully in a manner that's at least somewhat uh, coherent. So I think on the Israeli right wing, you have a few terms that are basically forbidden. And the first kind of encounter I had with this was actually my first summer in Israel. I actually worked as a copy editor at a newspaper. I won't say which newspaper. It turned out to be essentially a temporary job. It was paid by the hour. It was a few hours per week, so I didn't think of this as like a career job, but I did it uh, for a summer. I think I was there for three or four months working a few shifts per week, and then I transitioned into uh, office jobs and uh, what I do now and working in communications. But that was the start of my career in Israel. It was a right-leaning newspaper, and for those not familiar with the world of the declining world of uh, journalism and uh, editorial, uh, something that's very common for a publication to have, in fact, traditionally sort of essential. And this is carried over into the online world as well. You'll find now that online media outlets and even, um, even content sort of websites will have this. It's called a style guide. 
a style guide basically sets out what the conventions are going to be for that publication. Do we, and it goes down into the most minute detail of, you know, do we use numbers from one to five? Um, there are some generally accepted style guides like AP, and then it's common that a publication will use a major style guide and have its own kind of remix on it, its own idiosyncratic spins. Now, when I was working for this right-wing Israeli publication as a copy editor, which means I was basically looking at copy coming in from correspondence or from newswire sources and editing it for conformity with the style guide. And some very interesting things were in the style guide and that's what kind of sparked my interest, I guess you could say, in the role of language in this conflict. And those words were basically forbidden. And the words were as follows. Actually, there's only one word. Maybe not the best example, but the word that was forbidden was East Jerusalem. We weren't allowed to write East Jerusalem, those two words together. You could refer to it as Eastern Jerusalem, but not East Jerusalem. Now you might be wondering, well, what's the difference? So in the hardline nationalistic right wing Israeli rhetoric, Jerusalem is united and there can be no, if it's a united city, there can be no West Jerusalem in capital letters or East Jerusalem in capital letters. However, there can be an East Jerusalem in a small letter because it's a geographical descriptor and if it's, if it's not both capitals, it's the description of a place. And there can be an Eastern Jerusalem because Eastern is a geographical descriptor. And again, so long as you don't put East Jerusalem next to each other with a big E and a big J, that was fine. If the correspondent had that, that was not fine. That would need to be edited for conformity with the, the style guide. Now, I'm obviously bringing in a kind of marginal example here, and I don't know if this publication has changed its style guide, but I don't think it has. I regularly read news from places like Ynet and Arut Sheva and Jerusalem Post probably also in this category as well. And I noticed that things have, you'll notice very small things in the copy if you pay attention. Like again, a report about rioting might say, rioting in Eastern Jerusalem. Arabs are rioting in Eastern Jerusalem tonight. And I won't say Palestinians are rioting in East Jerusalem, which is probably how most people would uh, refer to it. So there's a few other examples of words, I think, that are kind of forbidden on the, in the Israeli right wing. And I'm not sure to what extent all this is kind of known outside of Israel, which is, again, sort of why I'm doing this. West Bank is another word that people will object to. Uh, the reason people will object to the West Bank is the traditional, the description in Hebrew for the area that most of the world refer to as the West Bank is Yehuda Shomron. It's named after uh, two historical regions where Judaism took hold. And so for people to refer to the West Bank might sound like a neutral term. It's called the West Bank because it's a territory uh, to the west of the Jordan River. At least that's my understanding. But it's gives equality to competing claims to the same territory. Whereas the word Yehuda v'shomron, Yehuda, is where Jews get their names from, right? It even sounds cognate in English, Jews, Yehud in Arabic, Yehuda in, in Hebrew, right? It's all very, very precise and deliberate, the use of these words. So the first term on the Israeli right wing that I would call quasi-forbidden, or depending on what circles and how far right you go, outright forbidden, is East Jerusalem. Number two is the West Bank. And the third one is unsurprisingly going to be Palestinians. The rationale, the rationale here for those on the Israeli right is going to be to say, well, Palestinians in the fourth is Palestine, but let's just take them together because it's the same point. The Israeli right wing will say, well, you know what? There was never a state called Palestine. So we can't refer to this aspirational state sort of existing state in a, in a sense as Palestine because that would be lending credence to something we that we're going to say didn't exist and we're going to deny its sort of right to exist linguistically. And the same thing will go for Palestinians. So again, if you pay attention to not just, I'm um, talked about firstly about media outlets, but also when just kind of, if you're debating people on the Israeli right, conspicuous subtle details that might take a while to spot. And two of those details you'll frequently see will be the refusal to use the word Palestine and Palestinians. And the typical substitute will be Arabs 
uh, Arabs and Palestinian Arab controlled areas, right? Any way you can describe area A and B of the West Bank and Gaza, which is what we're uh, what we're what we're talking about here, might be Hamas or Arab occupied Israel. That would be a very very far right fringe term, but I've seen that written as well. So again, very specific. Now that's on the Israeli side, and I would say we're we were veering there towards the end, more towards the extremist narrative. And I'm just going to point out the exact same phenomenon exists in the Palestinian and Arab debate. So my point, my my point, my idea in recording this video is not to say this is terrible. These are all the, you know, these are all the words that um, a lot of people in Israel are the forbidden list words that people in Israel won't use because I think there is a mirror image of this on the Palestinian side, and it naturally doesn't. Do much for dialogue. I'm just going to say my personal take on the matter. I would actually regard myself as leaning towards increasingly the right wing of the Israeli perspective. Nevertheless, I use these words all the time. Now, maybe what I'm going to say disqualif disqualifies me as being on the Israeli right, and that's that I partake now and again in a uh, dialogue group. It brings together a friend of mine, organizes it, and he brings together regular Israelis and Palestinians to meet for a burger or beer just to get to know one another as human as human beings one to one I see a lot of value in it for me the problem with this policy to put my cards on the table here is I think it makes dialogue impossible when you re refuse to use if I go to an interface diet I'm you know my personal take I've written a blog on this matter before is I'm sometimes hesitant myself to use the word Palestine not for any of the reasons that are the typical reasons, but because to me it describes as existing uh, a state that right now does only exist on paper. Right now the situation on the ground is that you have area A cities, area B villages, Gaza, no connection between any of these places, roadblocks between all these cities, no freely controlled airport, no freely controlled seaport. And for me to talk about that as Palestine as if it's already an existing uh, country is problematic now that's it's slightly different that's a very different conception than the way a lot of Palestinians will have and they will talk about it because they in an, in the sense of wanting to erase Jewish connection to Israel and Israeli identity they'll talk about Palestine in the sense that all of this is Palestine all of it always was Palestine and therefore the fact that it's Israeli controlled is kind of an irrelevancy talking about the Palestinian side for a moment it's very interesting to me always has been how the difference between the common parlance relating to Israel and the official stance and I think you'll see a mirror image reflection here that you'll have on the Israeli right wing the more as you go to more of the extremist camps there's language that people will use every day because it's what's normal and convenient it's, it's more easy to talk about the uh, you know the Palestinians than to come up with awkward workarounds like this group of Arabs or the Arabs living in Israel or again this is I don't endorse this language at all but the Arabs occupying Israel it's easier to just go for the normal word than it is to find these ways to deny using that word and you'll see it on the pa on the Palestinian side where you will there isn't there is a word in Arabic for Israel Israel this way it's written out in Arabic means that it's uh, it's pronounced. It's not in in Hebrew. It's Yisrael. In Israel, it's Israel with the emphasis on the first syllable. And in Arabic, it's Israel, which places the emphasis on the last. It's just got to do with how it's written. But if you listen to hard right nationalistic propaganda channels, Al Quds TV, Hamas backed sponsored. A channel in uh, Jerusalem Al Uds Network in Lebanon Al Manar TV. You will not generally hear uh, people referring to Israel. You'll hear people referring to Al Adu Al Sahuni, which means the Zionist uh, enemy. Al Adu is enemy. You'll also hear uh, Israel referred to as the Zionist entity. That seems to be more common for. Iranian uh, spokespeople for whatever reason but does it really matter if you're calling it the Zionist entity or the Zionist enemy either way you're basically trying to deny Israel by not using the word Israel and there's other equivalencies of that but then you'll often hear people interviewed the same people interviewed 
uh, on the street. And a, a good channel I recommend on YouTube is The Ask Project by Corey Goldschuster. And those very same people or the people with those viewpoints in their day-to-day -day speech will talk about uh, Israel instead of... Uh, or another one might be Ihtilal il, 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 il Zahyuni, the Zionist uh, occupier or the Zionist occupation. Again, I'm just... Trying to fill out examples again, just to point out that it's on both sides. I'm not sure I've reached any um, conclusion here, rather than just to talk about this, because I think it's one aspect of uh, the conflict that is linguistic, purely linguistic. And, you know, when all this stuff gets translated out to English, for the most part, this kind of gets lost, because international media organizations don't have style guides that adhere to these conventions, so people assume that the news is being reported on in a kind of standard manner by both sides of the conflict, when in reality there are stark differences in what is linguistically acceptable or appropriate within both speaker groups on the margins of the Israel-Palestinian conflict, Israeli-Arab conflict. You'll see that reflected in the media more than you will in people's day-to-day -day life, uh, but I think it's, a, it's an example of the level of disconnect that exists here. And personally, again, to put my cards on the table, I think even if I'm against a Palestinian state, even if I don't, if I don't think there was ever a Palestine, I don't therefore think for me to deny, firstly, to attempt to engage someone in dialogue without and then tr try to do that while denying their identity is something completely unreasonable. And I don't think it's Israel's right. I think whatever, however they choose to self identify I, I think for Israel to deny another people, it's ability to self-identify however they want is massively massively problematic so it's not not something I endorse I speak all the time um, about East Jerusalem I don't talk about Eastern Jerusalem I talk about the West Bank and Yehuda and Shomron 50 50 uh, West Bank because it's what's familiar to me Yehuda and Shomron uh, because I hear it in the Israeli media and it, it's a almost a better geographical des descriptor. And I refer to Palestinians as Palestinians because if that's what they want to be called, that's the language I'm going to use when talking about them. And in the very in my very limited experience in dialogue groups when talking to them. That was a hot take uh, here in Jerusalem. Uh, I hope it's been uh, it's been interesting. If you do have uh, thoughts that uh, adhere, adhere to YouTube's comment po comments policy and are not just generally tirades against me, I'd appreciate. Less of those uh, if, if you're thinking of them, but just uh, dialogue. Um, if you disagree with me, you think that it is good not to use certain words. You support the restriction of language to support your cause, whether you're on the Israeli side or the Palestinian side, and you think that's legitimate and valid, and there are reasons that I haven't covered or left out, feel free to chip in with that uh, comments along those lines. And of course, thanks for watching. And if you do want to get more videos, from me about stuff related to Israel, Jerusalem and stuff going on here, do uh, subscribe to the this YouTube channel and have a good day.